Uh, my name's Murray Fredericks. Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, I'm a visual artist working mostly in photography, uh, time-lapse video, and in uh, film. I've had a role in the production and uh, the filming of a couple of very long-term documentaries. And that finds me, or leads me, to places like the middle of Lake Eyre and also to the Greenland Ice Cap, where I've spent the last 15 years of my life. Um, I take, in, over the years and years that I spend in these places, I take literally thousands and thousands of photographs. Um, but the final breakdown, the final edit of those images, if you like, ends up being incredibly small. It's often around 35 or 40 images from years and years of work. And the reason that there's such a small amount of images is that so few of the images convey not the place, not what it actually looks like, but what it genuinely feels like to be there. Now, as I started before, I wasn't trained to be a visual artist uh, growing up, and I never had any formal training. I uh, was quickly thrown, if you like, or pushed into an economics and politics degree, uh, not long announce after announcing to my parents when I finished school that I wanted to be an artist. Um, I think they felt that I'd invested far too much in my education <laughs> to that point. Um, like a, a good arts or humanities student. Uh, I spent probably a year and a half longer than I should have at university. Uh, <laughs> and I think I passed with 51% uh, 1 rest, uh, representing wasted effort. <laughs> uh, not long after finishing university, I took off for a planned six-month trip to Europe in that good old Australian tradition. And three years later, I found myself uh, sitting on a local rickety old bus travelling through the bottom of Iran and Pakistan. I was completely fascinated with the deserts of the Middle East and I wasn't sure exactly what it was. I wasn't sure exactly why I was being drawn there. But I remember on this one particular occasion, for about five days I'd been sitting on and off this bus staring at what was a very drab, empty place, empty landscapes. There, there was no scenery, no view. And I started to notice this connection. I started to notice this excitement or this energy, if you will. Either in me or, say, it was coming from the landscape, I, I couldn't quite tell. But there was a response. There was a genuine, a genuine response to what I was seeing. I decided that that was something special. It, 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 was, it was subtle, but it was significant. And I decided at that moment that I had to return to this path that I'd always wanted to be on, which was being a, a photographer or, or, or an art, a visual artist. So I went back to Australia. I got myself um, a couple of uh, you know, part-time jobs, waiting, all that kind of stuff, doing short courses. And then there was this frustration that a lot of creatives go through when they're starting out. You've made the decision. But how do you get to become a full-time artist? And there's this, you know where you want to be, you know what it feels like, but there's this massive gap there and how do you broach that gap in talent, in quality, and in refinement of vision, if you like. And I went through this experience, I, I underwent a whole lot of trauma, unexpectedly. Um, not just one event, but there was four or five separate events. And when you're confronted with death and other things around you, and I'm sure there's a lot of people in this room who, who've been through similar things. As bad as it is and as horrible it is to, to go through, you also, at some stage in the process, get a sense of perspective on life. It's like you get a look, you get a window for a moment on what's important. And I decided in that period to get through this time, to get through this gap and to become an artist no matter what it took. I got all the money I had together and I bought eight months worth of film. Back then it was film. And it was a bag that looked like this. And I stuck that in the top of my backpack and I went off to India. Because in India I knew with the limited funds that I had I could live and work for about $10 a day. And I treated every day like work. And I wasn't sure, I was following some vague rumbling in my subconscious that I wanted to be an artist. And I found myself drawn up continually above the tree line, not to get this kind of heroic view over the mountains or anything like that, but to experience the landscape itself without any clutter. 
I wasn't interested in the valleys and the lushness and the pretty scenes, if you like. I wasn't interested in sunsets, those kind of lush, beautiful, what I would call typical or very traditional landscape scenes. And for the next seven years, I worked in Patagonia, Tasmania, and in the Himalaya, all above the tree line, in areas where I actually felt my mind could spread out over the landscape. Now, I had a number of exhibitions in those times, and I was starting to get a little bit of success, I guess you'd call it, a bit of recognition, which is very important for an artist to keep going. And people started saying things to me in, I guess nowadays I'd just call it contemporary art speak, but it was a language that I just didn't understand. And that frustrated me, and I could tell that there was some kind of block there, so I, I said, right, that's just another challenge, I'm going to take myself off to art school. So at 33, I did a master's in visual arts uh, down in Sydney. And far from just learning the language, I had this incredible experience of being able to study the lives of other artists and to see what they went through, how they did it, how they achieved their challenges. And also I learned to think critically about imagery. And I realised that the work that you've just seen, those first seven years that I was going through, was great in terms of its motivation, but it was about 100 years out of date in its delivery, in its method of delivery. And once I realised that, saying to myself, realising that art is of a time and that I wanted to be an artist of my time, I had to find another language. Uh, number three, please. So I got myself thinking and I said, OK, what is it? What is it that I'm about? And that's what I'm about. That's, you know, on a theoretical level, that's what I'm about. Space, place and landscape. And primarily space. Now, space is a very funny topic to approach because it's an abstract concept. It doesn't actually exist. There's always something there. But we can have a cultural space. We can have a space that feels... It has, we, can ha we can have somewhere that feels like a space. And in that way, it's more important for me to think about space by what it does. To me, space is something that induces a certain quality. Qualities of freedom and instability. Qualities of metaphysical unboundedness. This is a quote by Liz Wells, by the way. The poetic and voidness. So in a way, that's what I was searching for. And I remembered standing on a salt lake earlier in my travels and walking out into the night from a camp and just standing there losing myself in the blackness. And it was almost like the physical boundaries of my body, just for a moment, disappeared or I wasn't sure where my body ended and the landscape started. And my senses were a bit confused. It was pitch black. And I, I remember seeing a lightning flash off in the distance and getting this sense of, of that, of this, I guess, metaphysical unboundedness, if we, ha if we, if we have to put a word around it. And I remember at that time thinking there could be a project in this, and that thought came back to me. And I thought, we've got a salt plain here in Australia, and it's called Lake Eyre. So I took myself off to see the farmers whose, la whose property bounds Lake Eyre. They said to me on the first phone call, we like artists. And then when I turned up with a the camera, they said, I thought you said you're an artist. <laughs> and they told me that about 200 kilometres from the homestead was the edge of the lake, and that's where I'd find the salt. For the first year of the project, or first two years, I camped on the edge, and I walked out. You can actually see my tracks walking out. There's about two to four kilometres of deep, thick mud. And that was fine. I was getting out there and I was getting some sensation of being out there, being immersed in this space. But 180 degrees behind me was the shore, and every time I finished a shoot, I had to get myself off the lake. Now, not only was this exhausting, going back and forth every time I wanted to take a photograph through the mud, more importantly, it disconnected me from the place. It disconnected me from this location that I wanted to be part of. 
So I started thinking, how could I live? How could I remain in the middle? And what would that be like? Would it actually affect the work if I was to remain out in the middle of the lake for a month? So I bought myself a mountain bike. I didn't test this, by the way. I loaded up all my gear, 50 kilos of water, all my cameras, and snapped the trailer off the back the first time I tried to push it through the mud. <laughs> but after two days, it took me two days to go four kilometres on that first trip, I did get out to the salt. And I'll never forget, I, I thought the whole time I was pushing out there, I'd have this sense of achievement. But once I got out there, and I started to move and glide off, and once the shore behind me disappeared, I felt this incredible sense of release. And that's the only way I can describe it. There was no sense of achievement or I've done it or self-congratulation. It was a complete release. And in a way, I felt my psyche, I felt my whole sense of who I was releasing into the void, into the emptiness that was out there. So I established camp out there in the middle and I started work. But I had this incredible urge, once I'd started camp, once I'd set up camp, was that the urge was that I couldn't keep still. I had to get to know this place. And that didn't really make sense because it was all the same. I mean, once you're out of sight of land, it's just geometric patterns off to the horizon as far as you can see. But I felt this incredible desire to push onwards and get to know this whole place. So I rode around and I discovered that there are actually slight depressions in the lake. You can't see them, but the salt patterns and everything else are different there. And those patterns became incredibly significant when it rained because they filled up with water and created mini lakes. Now that water was 10 times saltier than seawater, which meant when the wind blew, even up to about 20 knots, it was still a mirror. And also, it seemed to reflect light with more vividness. And that, to a photographer, is like gold. It was incredible. That sense of being driven to search around is called, or the motivation behind this is called topophilia, or love of place. Human beings are programmed to confront space in a certain way. We want to divide it up. We want to map it. On an evolutionary level, that makes perfect sense, because we want to know where we're going and how to get back. And we also want to know where the safe points are. So for the next seven years, I went through this process of getting to know the lake, not just on one visit, but in all there were 16 visits over eight years to the lake. And while there was different weather, while there was different conditions, while the water and the surface changed, I felt that there was a reason to continue on with the project this whole sense of colour would come down. It was like standing in a planetarium when this stuff would happen. And, you, and you'd, you'd actually lose your sense of reality, your sense of where you were. It, it really was transportive. It was, as I keep saying, it was these changes and this, this whole idea of topophilia where we're driven to get to know somewhere. And, and it's, it's a very, very deep urge. But at the same time, these changes would come in and it was almost like I, I didn't know the place again. It was almost like everything was completely new. And with that came this thrill, came this excitement. And whenever I felt that, I knew it was time to get the camera out. And I think, in many ways, what was happening there, if we go back to this theoretical um, look of, uh, these theoretical approaches to it, of place and space, I really see that the space, the idea of this unfamiliarity, the newness, the release and the freedom, is a concept or a feeling that was much more aligned with the subconscious. And this sense of familiarity when I'd been out there for years and years that was edging away at that, once I got to know this place, um, was much more to do with the rational mind or the front of the mind. And it was a to the, for me, the challenge and, if you like, the tension was constantly edging back towards these kinds of images. And to get these kinds of images, it has to be a whole body... Or for me, it had to be a whole body thing. It had to, I actually had to be living it and going through it. This red salt is actually created by an organism uh, when those lakes intensify into the middle. When, as they evaporate, it concentrates in highly saline sol solutions at a very high temperature. There's an outbreak of a bacteria which turns all the water red. And then as the salt finally 
um, dries out and evaporates, the redness goes like a dye. And sometimes those red patches can be kilometres long. They're, they're, they're incredible. Some years the drought came across and, and deposited dust. That's where the yellowness came, all across the lake. The years that there weren't change, I'd see where the lakes used to form and I'd actually recall in my mind what I called the good times. <laughs> and I'd crave them. You become attached to these kinds of things. And night was a change. And sometimes these changes could be accessed on different timescales. This is the project after Lake Eyre. This is the one that I've just finished for the last four years. This actual, pro this actual project is called Topophilia. This is an abandoned nuclear missile detection station plonked right down in the middle of the Greenland ice cap. To me, it represents this wonderful intersection of place and space, of man and the landscape. And inside that is the remnants of identity of everyone who had to live there. Some people lived there for up to 20 years. This place that's a void, this place that has emptiness, changes so much. And that change, is, it's not just change like a calendar saying this is the many moods of the lake or this is the many moods of the ice cap. Because for me, it's about having an emotional platform to work from. The imagery itself has to transcend what we're seeing. For me, the imagery... Had, as I just said, the imagery had to be produced from the right place. And being out there for a month at a time, or the Greenland trip once we were out there for three months, was long enough to create this filter in your mind that allowed you to, one, become familiar with this place you were at, but then when there was a change, to be thrown back into this sense of insecurity, this sense of instability, and with that, the thrill of freedom that comes from change when you're in this dome-like planetarium, it becomes your whole world and you get swallowed up in it. And while that sensation kept happening, I kept shooting. And at the end of eight years, when I knew the lake so well, I knew the moods and the changes and everything so well, I could no longer access that freshness. I could no longer access that sense of newness, that sense of unfamiliarity that sense of being put slightly on ease by the change. And that's when I knew it was time to pack up and go. Thank you very much. <laughs>